Uh... Hello and welcome to Hug in the Snug and today I'm joined by Dr Stefan Harding who is the Ecologist in Residence at Schumacher College. Um, before we get started with the questions, it's called Hug in the Snug, so we're in the snug, now we have to have the hug. Okay, so I really wanted to talk to you today because the fifth IPCC report is coming out this week. Um, why does that matter? What's it about? What is it? Well, it matters because it's a report compiled by the world's leading climate scientists, about 250 of them from around the world. And it's a sort of a global take, scientific take, on the state of the climate. Okay. And the basic message is going to be that the climate situation is very serious, dangerous, and that we are responsible for creating the situation, the dangerous situation. And that's sort of unequivocal, it's, that's what, what's yes, happening? Yes, I would say it's unequivocal. Of course, you know, in science there's always little, little provisos and we talk about probabilities. The chances of the IPCC being wrong about climate change being dangerous are exceedingly low. So we should take it as pretty much certain fact as can be in science. So this report comes out, it tells us that we're causing climate change and it's a problem. Mm. Is everyone going to stop and do something about it then? Probably not. <laughs> it's very strange that information doesn't really seem to grab people's attention. So, um, of course, then also the sceptics are very strong. You know, they've managed to convince more people than one would have hoped in Britain and around the world that climate change isn't important if it is happening or perhaps that it isn't happening at all. Um, and so they're going to have a field there trying to pick it to pieces. And is there anything in there that they might pick up on that we should be sort of ready and ready to explore? Probably they'll pick up on the fact that the climate hasn't warmed very much over the last decade or so. There's been a stabilisation in the temperature increase, even though that plateau is much higher than pre-industrial levels. They'll say, oh look, this shows that you know, it's not happening, or uh, if it is happening, it's stopped. Um, so they'll pick up on that, I think. And how, has it stopped? Does, does a plateau mean that the climate isn't changing, there isn't global warming? Well, no, as I said, the first thing one has to remember is that the pl there is a plateau, so the warming has, has uh, levelled out over the last decade or so, but that, that plateau level is much, much higher than it ought to be. So it's still much warmer but than it should be. It's just not warming Yeah, the warming has quickly. Yeah, quickly. has stabilised over the last decade. But the general trend since the Industrial Revolution of the warming is up. And we know that in any, in any complex system there's bound to be ups and downs and you know, little blips and increases and decreases. We need to look at the general trend. The general trend is still up. The scientists think that the extra heat that's gone into the system is being absorbed by the deep by the ocean. It's going into the deep ocean, so the ocean is kind of helping us out in a way. And will it keep helping us out? Does that mean we can just not worry about it because it will no. get warmer and the ocean will take it? No, because the energy is in the Earth system, and it has to do something. It has to do, the definition of energy is the capacity to do work. So it's going to do some work, and sooner or later that heat is going to get itself back into the atmosphere, and it's going to start causing damage. And what kind of damage are we talking? Well, it depends. Uh, on the climate sensitivity. It depends on how sensitive the climate is to CO2 and other greenhouse gases. But if it comes to the worst case, which is possible, we might end up with 4 to 6 degrees centigrade warming in relation to pre-industrial levels, say, by the end of the century, possibly. That's basically the end of civilization. Is that... The end of civilization sounds quite dramatic. 4 mm. to 6 degrees, you know, if I go on a holiday... It's four degrees warmer yes. in France, and I'm fine. Yes, you know, yes. what, what, are you being overdramatic? What is that? No, really no, mean? we're being. This is very sanguine, reasoned, careful scientific analysis, not drama at all. It's four or six is the average temperature, which means that some places will be much hotter, some places will be cooler, but the average, the global average, will be four to six degrees. If we look in the Earth's history in the past, when there's been a six degree warming, there have been tremendous problems for the Earth. And so we know that six degree warming will lead to sea level rise, that it'll lead to droughts, it'll lead to fires, it could lead to massive releases of methane from the permafrost, which will further warm things up. So we know that it's very likely that six degrees will mean will make the planet uninhabitable for civilization. Not for humans, there'll still be humans, but there won't be you know nice comfortable cities like New York and London, they'll be flooded. There'll be millions upon millions of climate refugees. It really is 
a dreadful scenario to contemplate. And that's... Should I be, you know, building a bunker and buying some tins? Is that going to be happening? No, that's not going to help you at all. <laughs> not at all. What you've got to do, what we've all got to do is consume less. We've got to stop this massive lust for buying stuff, for products, for more and more stuff, more and more phones, more and more planes, more and more... That's what's driving it. It's just sheer, unadulterated greed. And also, the lack of understanding that the Earth is limited. Very, the Earth is a generous planet, you know. We know that she can absorb, say, three gigatons per year of our carbon emissions. That's very generous. But she has a limit. There's only so much carbon she can absorb. There's only so many minerals we can extract from the Earth before we start to destabilise the global ecosystem. And we've reached that point now. We've, we're pushing up against the planetary boundaries. And once we transgress those boundaries, the planet could well tip itself into an uninhabitable, or rather inhospitable state for ourselves and for many other species. And we already know that we have tipped the planet beyond three of the most important boundaries, the biodiversity loss, climate change, and phosphorus loading in the biosphere. So those have happened. They have science happened. Science shows that. It backs it up. Yeah, it's all backed up with the science. And that's going to have consequences. It will. We will get warming. Even if we start to uh, withdraw now, even if we start to use less and consume less and move to renewable energies, right now we're still going to get warming. But it, you know, if we can keep it to, say, 1 degree, 1.5 degrees, we, we'll, civilization will survive and eventually the Earth may get back to something like the pre-industrial level. So... Right now, we, we have that choice for how much warming, you know, the more yeah. we do to prevent yes. our emissions and our impact, yeah. the, even though there's going to be warming, the less that warming is going to be, and the lower those impacts that yeah. are going to happen, but we get to decide how strong. Exactly. We've got to act now. It's no use waiting. The longer you wait, the more difficult the problem becomes. And eventually, if you wait too long, the whole Earth will pass various tipping points, beyond which it'll be impossible to get back to the current situation, the climatic situation. There'll be a sort of runaway effects. Okay. And we may already be seeing some runaway effects with the loss of the Arctic sea ice, but there'll be others. Once we've reached a certain number of runaway effects, then it's too late. The whole Earth moves through positive feedback into a new, probably hot and very inhospitable state. But now it looks like we still have a little bit of time left. And that's the good news. The bad <laughs> news is that if, if we do nothing, Civilization is almost certainly finished. So, you know, from you saying that, there is a report coming out <clears throat> this week <clears throat> that basically says, you know, science has a consensus, this is going to happen. <clears throat> and, you know, if, it, if, if the data that you're telling me is in there, that, you know, we have a chance right now to do something about it. <clears throat> and you're saying governments probably aren't going to, you know, you'd think in a reasoned world that that lands on people's desks or they read about it and everyone says, right. Let's change it, but that's that's not what's going to happen on Friday. We're not going to no. suddenly all up arms and and change the world. No, I'm afraid not. So, what would it take if you know if a report of all of the world's scientists putting all of the data that they have together to try and inform the governments and businesses that there's something happening that they need to think about it? If that doesn't work, what is it going to take for the government to actually, or governments around the world and organisations around the world to actually decide to take the kind of action that's needed? Two possibilities. <clears throat> One is some very serious disasters, climate disasters. We've had plenty of those already. We've had flooding in the UK. We've had those fires in America. We've had a whole series of really serious extreme weather events, haven't we? <clears throat> but still, they haven't worked. You would have thought they would have worked. Uh, the other possibility is to, for people to become deeply ecologically literate, to really understand that we live in an, a totally interconnected Earth system. Uh, and that, you know, if we start to destabilise certain of those key ecosystems and processes that maintain a stable climate, that the Earth system as a whole will feed back to destabilise us. So we're lacking basic ecological literacy. People just don't understand how interconnected we are with the rest of our planet. So if everyone sort of understood and believed that we are actually reliant on our planet mm. and part of our mm. planet and that our impacts have a difference that would, people would be in the right mindset for doing what's needed. And should that come from schools? Is that something that, how can, how can that, you know, ecological literacy come about? Mm. It's very difficult to deal with politicians and business people and get them to be ecologically literate. One way to do it is to take them outdoors, 
and to sit them around a campfire so they can actually feel their connection with nature and then give them really good, then give them good scientific information. But if they're stuck in their office in Whitehall, you know, in, uh, inoculated from the outside environment, insulated from the outside environment, um, just looking at some numbers and graphs, then it's not going to work. Because they're, they're hell-bent on growing the economy. That's the main thing that they want to do, grow the economy. But unfortunately, economic growth in its conventional sense is destroying the planet because it's extracting more and more materials from, from the Earth. Surely any truly rational person can understand that. So I think politicians, business people possibly, the culture as a whole is not deeply rational. Okay. And if, let's say, in 30 seconds, you're holding the report, you have all of the world's business and government leaders in a room, and you've got 30 seconds to address them, to tell them, you know, take note, what should you do, what would your, what would your message to them be? I would say to them, this report represents a fantastic business opportunity, and a fantastic opportunity for intelligent growth. At the moment, we've pursued a path of suicidal growth. If we keep growing the economy that we've been doing it up till now, it's suicide, end of civilization. If we develop a new kind of growth based on renewable energies, etc., we can have intelligent growth and we can have a fantastic planet to live in for many, many generations. Well, let's hope they listen. <laughs> uh, Dr. Stephen Harling, thank you for coming in. Uh, thank you very much. Pleasure, thank you.